There are only a handful of events in your life that you remember where you were. For many Americans, such as myself, 9-11 was one. For the older generation, the assassination of John F. Kennedy was another. For me, it was the day that my parents died. I hope that no one has to go through the pain that I went through that snowy January evening. And if you've had the unfortunate luck to experience that kind of trauma, then my thoughts are with you. I was very close with my parents. My father, a college professor, always told me the importance of getting good grades and staying in school. My mother, a nurse, always told me to help others in times of need. They were the perfect role models. And the day they died, a part of me died as well. Their car had slid off an embankment in the snow and ice and crashed, killing them almost instantly. I was at the bar with a few friends and my fiancé at the time when I received the phone call from the local police. I was away at college when it happened, and unfortunately, nearly 400 miles away. The news hit me like a ton of bricks, and all I could do was stare endlessly into the background. The lights were on, but nobody was home, if that makes any sense. After the funeral, my brother Joe and I started going through their house, gathering their belongings, so it could either be sold, rented out, or become the property of the bank. The familiar smell of the home reminded me of better times. Times when I woke up on Christmas morning to see a Nintendo 64 and Pokemon Stadium waiting for me. You know, those good times. Like an episode of Scooby-Doo, Joe and I split up to make the job easier. I would be in charge of the basement and main floor, while Joe would be in charge of the top floor and attic. I started on the main floor, maybe because I still had this irrational fear of that basement. When I was younger, I fell down the steps and broke both my legs and my right wrist in the process, all these years later, and it's still implanted in my mind. And after taking a break to sit down, rest, and enjoy a cold beer, I opened the door to the basement. I looked down the narrow flight of stairs, memories of eight-year-old me falling down and breaking bones flashing before my eyes. I gulped and took it one step at a time. Once in the basement, the old musty smell became familiar with my nostrils. I looked over toward the single window in the basement, where a framed photo of my mother and father hung below it. There was a time when my father wanted to make the basement a lower level family room, but the hunged photo was as far as he got. Under the stairwell, there were a few boxes from previous years that have yet to be unpacked. I pulled up an old wooden chair and began to search through the boxes, hoping that I would find something worth keeping. The first box was just holiday decorations. Christmas, Halloween, hell, even Thanksgiving. My mother was very festive, no matter the holiday. I set it off to the side and pulled the next box closer to me. There was an old white binder that had hundreds of Pokemon cards in the sleeves. I felt like I had just discovered gold in the form of these little paper cards. I flipped through the pages, smiling from ear to ear. For those of you who are too young or too old to appreciate Pokemon cards, it was the greatest thing for an 8 year old in the 90s. Hell, I even went to a few tournaments and won a few badges. The rest of the box was almost uneventful. There were some old pieces of art that Joe and I had drew in class, but nothing worth keeping. As I searched through the remaining boxes, I thought for sure that there would be nothing else. The last box just had old silverware and plates, half of which were cracked and broken. I pulled out my phone to turn on the flashlight to search under the stairwell in case I missed anything. And that was when I saw a small brown box tucked into the back corner. On my hands and knees, I crawled under the stairwell and grabbed the box. The box was covered in dust, seemingly untouched in at least a decade. As I wiped the dust off, I opened the box to see a set of videotapes. Intrigued, I grabbed the Pokemon binder and other materials that I deemed worthy to keep, placed them in the box with the tapes, and headed upstairs. Once I exited the darkness of the basement, I saw Joe sitting on the couch, smoking a cigar. You took long enough. He said sarcastically. Where did you get those cigars? You don't even smoke. I found them upstairs. They're high quality stogies. I think dad was saving them for a special occasion. I couldn't help but feel disgusted that my brother would smoke a cigar that our dad was saving for a special occasion, knowing damn well that less than a week ago he passed away. I sat down next to him on the couch and placed the box on the coffee table in front of us. Why in the fuck would you put that dusty ass box on this good table? That was a good question, but I just smirked and shrugged it off. Look at this, dude. My old Pokemon binder. I bet some of these cards are worth a good penny, especially since they look to be in good condition. Yeah, you could sell them and make a five cent profit from all the money that mom and dad wasted on those things. Good investment. I set the binder to my side and pulled out the first videotape I saw. 
You want to watch some home movies and laugh at how fucking cringy we were? I said, waving the videotape in front of my brother. Yeah, let's just pop those right into the VHS player. Oh, wait a second, that's right. It's 2017. No one uses those anymore. He had a point, but I knew something he didn't. The secret compartment I made when I was younger in my room upstairs. I hopped up and ran upstairs to my old room. It was empty, but I knew what to look for. In the floor of my closet, I made a makeshift compartment to hide, well, adult-themed movies and magazines. In the compartment was an old VHS player that I would hook up to my TV when no one else was home. I ran downstairs with the VHS player in my hand and a giant grin on my face. Thank God I was a smart little pervert, I said, holding the VHS player above my head. Oh look, you found a VHS player. But please, tell me how that ancient thing is going to plug into this new TV. Are you going to science the shit out of this too? Again, another good point, but I knew better. When you were upstairs, did you find an older television? Yeah, but that was all I needed to know. I told him to follow me upstairs while I went into the attic. We brought the television back downstairs and plugged it in, along with the VHS player. Alright, you want to take bets on what the first video is? I'm going to guess that it's your 10th birthday party where you pissed your pants from the clown. Joe, shut the fuck up. I guess old wounds never heal. I popped in the first tape and walked backwards making sure it was loading up. The all-too-familiar blue screen appeared. I took a seat on the couch next to Joe as we watched the video begin to play. It was grainy and dark, but we can make out movement from the side. What the fuck is this? Some kind of backward-ass snuff film? Joe said in a mocking tone. The darkness soon disappeared as a light kicked in without warning. There, we saw a male and a female in white coats with white masks covering their faces. In the middle of the room was a lifeless body of a young boy, laying on his back with a black tarp over his body. We saw the feet and arms dangling off the side. Okay, what the fuck? Joe said, leaning forward. Turn this shit off, dude. This is some kind of illegal shit. I was a bit confused at what I was seeing. I gulped and continued watching, despite Joe's pleads. There was no sound to the video, just the video itself. The two white-dressed individuals nodded as a third person stepped into view. It had to have been at least seven feet tall. It was lanky and looked as if it hadn't eaten in quite some time. Its arms were very long, almost touching the ground. Its neck was elongated as well, but its head was very small, almost comically small. It did not look human at all. The creature began to slowly surround the lifeless body of the boy before it placed one of its long legs onto the bed where the boy was laying. It had only three toes from what I could see, but that could have just been the bad quality of the video. Joe and I watched in horror as this creature surrounded the child, but the real horror happened after it mounted the child and began to drag its tongue across the boy's cheek. The tongue was purple in color, very long, and very skinny, almost like a serpent. Turn this shit off, TJ! Joe demanded. I didn't listen. I was almost in a trance. I had no idea what I was watching. But whatever that creature was, it wasn't human. It dragged its tongue down the face and neck of the child, before placing its hands on the boy's face. The creature was in a squatting pose above the child, but its arms and legs were so long that it looked as if it were standing. Joe got up without hesitation and turned off the TV before we saw what was next. Dude, I fucking told you to turn that shit off. Whatever the hell this is, it's illegal. We need to show this to the fucking cops. Where did mom and dad get this shit from? And why do they have it? That was the $64 question. Joe, we have to watch these before we hand them over to the authorities. What if they're just some homemade horror film or something? We have to watch it to make sure it's real and not something that's made up. Or else the authorities are just going to laugh at us for being scared by a work of fiction. Reluctantly, Joe sat down and agreed. As we turned the television back on, we set it back to the part where we last left off, where the creature was squatting above the lifeless child with its hands on the boy's face and head. The creature dragged its finger across the cheek of the child, and its nail was so sharp that it left a visible cut across the boy's face. It was then that my eyes widened and I looked at Joe. Joe. What? Your scar. My brother's eyes widened. 
The cut across the boy's left cheek was very similar to a scar that was on Joe's face that apparently he got after falling off his bike at a young age. He never remembered it, but that's what we were told. Maybe it was just a coincidence, but things were starting to add up. The creature grabbed the leg of the child and began to drag its tongue up and down the left leg, as if it were enjoying the taste and smell of the boy. I gulped as I jumped up and paused the tape. Joe, look in the background. What do you see? I don't see shit, dude. It's so old and grainy. Look in the background by the window, then look under. What does that look like to you? Joe leaned in closer and squinted. Shit, it looks like a picture or something. I remember the picture hanging below our window in the basement, the basement that was directly below our feet. Against my better judgment, I hit play and sat back down. The creature continued to drag its tongue across the leg of the young boy before hopping down from the bed. It stood straight up and held its arms to its side. Its knuckles touched the ground. It was so tall that its head was out of view from the camera. The man and woman dressed in white nodded their heads as the creature bolted out of the camera view. The man in the white proceeded to walk toward the camera and turn it off as the screen turned to static. What the fuck was that, TJ? What the fuck? I tried to calm Joe down, but hell, even I was perplexed. I looked down into the box and realized there were more videos, but I did not want to look at what was next. I popped out the first video and set it to the side as I sat down on the couch next to Joe, who looked as if he had seen a ghost. There's three more videos, Joe, but Jesus Christ, I'm afraid of what they show. He hung his head into his hands and began to stomp his feet in disbelief. As we sat in silence on the couch, our attentions turned somewhere else. We heard a noise that was similar to something being dragged across the floor. It was coming from the basement. Shh! Did you hear that? My attention was brought toward the basement door for a moment, closing my eyes to listen as closely as I could for the noise I thought I heard. Joe wasn't as patient as I was. Hear what? I didn't hear shit. Almost on cue, the noise appeared again. The sound of something dragging. Joe's eyes became as wide as his mouth as he began to back away from the basement door in fear. What the fuck was that? He cried. I placed my index finger over my lips and proceeded to tell him to be quiet. I saw Joe gulp down his fear, but for some strange reason, my fear was overshadowed by my willingness to get to the bottom of what was going on. Against my better judgment, and against Joe's wishes, I opened the door to the basement. What the fuck are you doing? Let's get out of here. Joe's pleads fell on deaf ears. Look, if you want to leave, fine. But I'm going to go down there and see what that noise was. It's probably nothing. Nothing? Jesus Christ, we just watched a video of what looks like a young me and some fucking creature in our basement. And then we hear a noise coming from the basement and you tell me that it's nothing? I just wanted him to calm down. Truth be told, I wanted him to leave so I could be left alone and not have to listen to his constant bitching. You leave if you want. I'm going down. Joe shook his head in disbelief. You have lost your mind. I'm out of here. And that was that. I watched as Joe grabbed his coat and some belongings before leaving the house. Perhaps I should have done the same, but my curiosity got the better of me. I looked down at the bottom of the stairs leading into the basement. Nothing seemed out of place. I slowly descended the steps, making sure to grab the railing. Once I made it to the bottom, I flipped on the light at the end of the stairwell. I looked around for a moment until I saw a familiar picture that once hung below the window. It was now lying on the ground. I walked to the photo and hung it back up. While I was doing that, however, the dragging noise appeared again. I quickly jumped and turned to look behind me, but there was nothing. I looked at the empty black abyss that was the space under the stairs as I slowly began walking towards it. It appeared to be a black hole, and my curiosity was its gravitational pull, sucking me in. I grabbed my phone and turned on the flashlight again, but just as before, there was nothing under the stairs but dust and dead bugs. I tucked my phone back into my pocket and went back upstairs. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move. It moved incredibly fast. As I turned my head, my eyes became wide with fear. I was staring at a familiar sight, 
the sight of the creature in the video. It was taller than I imagined, skinny, lanky, with arms that dragged across the cement. Its neck was long and skinny, but its head was small. Its face had a pair of two dark eyes, practically black, no nose, but a smile, if you could call it that, which was crooked to the left side of its face. It stood there staring at me as if I were its prey. The creature was letting off a hideous odor that smelled like a mixture of rotten eggs and what I could only describe as roadkill. The creature bent down. I watched as its knees went above its shoulders in a crouched position, which seemed physically impossible. But then again, everything about this seemed impossible. The creature began to sniff around before crawling towards me slowly, its eyes maintaining focus on me. Its head was shaking back and forth uncontrollably as it approached. I had to make a move. I needed to make a move. Without hesitation, I bolted up the stairs and slammed the door behind me. I grabbed the boxes of videotapes, the VCR, and left the house, not looking back. I threw the box of tapes in the back of my Ford Focus and backed out of the driveway as fast as I could. I must have hit every red light on my way out of town. I refused to look back, fearing that I would see the creature. In a panic, I grabbed my phone and dialed Joe to talk to him, but the phone just kept ringing. You reached Joe. Leave a message. God damn it, Joe. I hung up the phone and tossed it to the side as I thought about what to do next. With nearly 400 miles back to my home on campus, I had no other option but to rent a hotel room for the night. Pulling up to a motel, I booked a room for the night and thought over everything in my head. Did I see what I thought I saw, or was my mind playing tricks on me? How did a creature that size remain hidden while I was down there? I sat on the edge of the motel bed, still in disbelief. I looked over at the box of videotapes and the VCR that I was able to get before I left. Looking back, Wasting the time to get that fucking VCR was stupid, but there had to be more to this story. I was able to plug the VCR into the hotel television and went over everything on my head again. Should I watch the next tape or should I go directly to the authorities? With a deep breath, I inserted the next tape and waited to see what was next. The video started out like the last one. Only this time, there wasn't a boy strapped down to a bed. Instead, the two white-dressed individuals stood off to the side with a pad and pen, jotting down something I couldn't read. There was a jump cut and my stomach began to turn. The camera was fixated on the creature, which was standing still against the cold cement wall of what looked like my basement. The creature's eyes were closed, and the mouth seemed to have disappeared. Its face was completely blank. Suddenly, the dark eyes opened and the crooked smile appeared. It didn't move, but it seemed to be awake. The two white-dressed people approached the creature and inserted a syringe into its elongated neck before the video cut. After another jump cut, the camera was pointed up the stairs toward the basement door. The door was closed, but not for long. The door opened and I saw my father slowly walking down the stairs. He seemed to be in a trance, and his eyes weren't what I remembered. They were pitch black. There was another jump cut to the creature. The creature was eating. What it was eating, I'm not entirely sure. It was slumped against the wall, picking up pieces of food with its long fingers and forcing it into its mouth. The creature's head did a 180 like an owl. It was now looking directly at the camera. The screen turned to static. I couldn't contain myself anymore. I got to my feet and headed to the bathroom, vomiting from what I just saw. The creature had made me physically ill, just by the way it looked and how abnormal it was. Leaning over the toilet, thoughts rushed through my head. What was this creature? Are there more like it? I flushed my vomit down the toilet and went to go get some rest. Everything from that night wore me out. I could decipher more of the videos tomorrow, after a decent night's sleep. I awoke the next morning to the sound of someone knocking on the door of my hotel room. In a groggy haze, I opened the door to see nobody there. When I looked down, I nearly jumped backward. Sitting on the ground was a single videotape. Shaking from head to toe, I swallowed my fear and picked up the tape. I looked around the hallway, but I saw no one. 
I closed my door, locked it, and sat at the edge of my bed. What was this tape? What was on it? Shit. I was too afraid to even find out. But I talked myself into it. But fuck. I wish I didn't. I put the tape into the VCR and braced myself for the worst. What I saw sent chills down my spine. It was Joe, not as a child, but as an adult, wearing the same clothes he was wearing last night. Behind him was the creature, resting both hands on his shoulders, standing tall with its head out of view of the camera. Joe's head was lowered, looking down at the ground below his feet. He seemed to be unconscious or unaware of what was going on, but he was breathing. Both Joe and the creature stood completely still for what seemed like hours, with the creature's hands placed firmly on his shoulders, tightening the grip with every passing moment. I watched in horror as the creature then dragged its tongue across Joe's cheek, before the video cut to static. The creature had Joe. The creature was still in that house. But then I thought, who was filming it? Jesus Christ, this can't be happening. I mumbled those words under my breath after watching the tape of the creature and Joe. Joe went back to the house after I left and tried to save me, but in return, he was taken by the creature. All I could think of was every time I would wish harm upon Joe for something he said or did, I would take it all back just to make sure he was safe. Thoughts spun on my head like a merry-go-round. I knew that time was of the essence, but I had no idea what to do. I had to go back. I had to save Joe. As I left my motel, every bad thought imaginable began to creep its way into my mind. From Joe being killed, to the creature being loose inside of the house. I couldn't shake these dreadful feelings. When I arrived back at my parents' house, the driveway was empty. There was no signs of Joe's red pickup truck as I imagined. I rushed into the house to find the basement door open, which was a bad sign. I ran as fast as I could, screaming Joe's name but heard nothing in return. I swung the basement door open and ran down the stairs until... darkness. I'm not sure what happened, but I awoke in pure darkness with a gash above my right eye. Above my eye was throbbing, and I could feel my heartbeat in my ears and in the back of my head. I blindly stretched out my hand to feel around in the darkness. I found what I assumed to be the cement wall of the basement. The wall served as a guide through the darkness. There was no light source at all, and my eyes had yet to adjust to the harsh darkness that was surrounding me. I blindly continued to feel my way around. I then started to hear unfamiliar noises. They sounded like footsteps coming from somewhere above me. I contemplated on what I should do next. Hello? TJ? Is anyone there? That was Joe's voice. There was a sense of salvation that I hadn't felt in a long time. Joe, I'm down here in the basement! I screamed. I heard the door open and a beam of light appear from the top of the stairs. I started making my way toward the light source where I met up with Joe. Fuck! I thought you were dead! Joe said as he smirked. What the fuck happened to your head? We walked up the stairs to the living room, where I collapsed on the couch. The bright lights of the living room caused my headache to intensify beyond belief. Joe grabbed a wet cloth and stopped the bleeding for a bit. Joe? Are you okay? I said looking at him with one eye closed. Yeah, why wouldn't I be? You're the one I've been worrying about. Look, I'm sorry about last night. You know, the whole leaving you behind thing. That shit just really creeped me out, you know? How did you know I was here? Joe smirked. Because you're like a real life Scooby-Doo detective or some shit. I knew that you would be back here at some point after what we found. What happened last night after I left? Did you watch any more of those tapes? I didn't know how to talk to Joe about the tape that I received at the hotel, but I had to tell him what I saw. Hey, can you do me a favor? Go to my car and grab those tapes from the VCR. I have something I want to show you. Joe shook his head. I'm not watching any more of that shit. You must be crazy. Maybe I was. Joe, listen to me. It's important, please. With a sigh, Joe went to my car and grabbed what I asked. He threw the box of tapes and VCR onto the couch. You set it up. You're welcome. 
It was nice to see that Joe was still as cheery as always. The tape with Joe and the creature was still in the VCR. So I plugged it into the television and hit play. I told Joe to watch closely. Joe watched in horror as he saw himself standing with the creature directly behind him. When I left last night, I ended up staying at a hotel. When I woke up, this was what I found. That's you, Joe. That's you and the creature. I, I don't remember any of this. What the fuck is going on? I don't know either, but this happened sometime last night after we left. Do you remember coming back at all last night? What? Hell no. When I left, I drove my ass right to Diana's and never looked back. Diana was his girlfriend. I only came back here because I couldn't get a hold of you and I was getting worried. I figured that you might be back here. And lo and behold, there you were. In the basement with a cut on your head. Nothing seemed to make sense. Joe didn't remember coming back. But on the video, he was with the creature. Perhaps the creature followed Joe last night and dragged him here without him knowing. TJ, I don't remember anything after I got to Diana's. Last night, I remember falling asleep in bed and waking up the next morning. No dreams, no nightmares, nothing. I placed my head into my hands in disbelief, trying to make sense of everything. Joe stood up from the couch. Be fucking honest with me. Last night in the basement, did you see anything? You said you left to go to the hotel after I left. But I feel like you're not telling me the whole story. What did you see, TJ? I had to tell him. I went down to the basement after you left to search around after hearing that noise. I saw the creature, Joe. It was more disturbing than I imagined. The creature lives in the basement. I saw the life drain from Joe as he looked at me in disbelief. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to leave, lock the door, and never look back. Let someone else deal with this. TJ, if you're smart, you're going to go along with this. Please, as your brother, I am begging you, leave. Just leave and go back home. Reluctantly, I nodded my head and grabbed my things, including the tapes and the VCR. Leave them too. I couldn't just leave them. There were still two more tapes to be watched. Perhaps it would provide clues as to what this creature is and how to stop it. Let's make a deal. We're going to watch these last two tapes. Then we'll leave and never look back. Okay? Reluctantly, Joe agreed. I popped the next tape in and sat down on the couch and prepared for the worst. The tape started out different from the others. It wasn't in the basement, but rather, Joe's bedroom. Joe was a kid, and he was sleeping soundly in his Buzz Lightyear pajamas. I could tell that this was causing Joe to feel uncomfortable, but for some reason we just kept watching. Suddenly, young Joe sat up abruptly in his bed. His eyes were as black as night, and he seemed to be in a trance. He then left the room. He appeared to be sleepwalking. The camera continued rolling for what seemed like hours, until young Joe made his way back into view. Suddenly our attention was brought towards the edge of the bed, where we saw a long lanky hand reach out and grab the bedsheet. The creature stood up and towered over young Joe, staring at him intensely. Joe didn't seem to notice. Just like before, the creature began to drag its tongue across the cheek of young Joe before stepping off and disappearing into the background. The video ended shortly after. Jesus Christ, Joe. What the hell was... I stopped mid-sentence as I looked over at Joe, who had a sick, demented smile on his face. His eyes were black, as black as night. There was a smell creeping into the room, an all-too-familiar scent. It was the scent of the creature. What the fuck? I was taken aback by Joe's appearance. But just as I was starting to back away, Joe began to speak. What's wrong, TJ? I was almost speechless. Your eyes! The smell! Everything was coming out in intervals, rather than all together. I think you're seeing shit, TJ. What are you going on about? I was dumbfounded. The smell became stronger and stronger. You don't smell that? I said covering my mouth and nose with my sleeve. It's the same scent I smelled when I saw, you know, that thing. Joe's voice and appearance returned to normal. I think you need some rest. You might just be losing your mind. Maybe he was right. Maybe I just imagined everything I saw moments before. As I got up to leave, Joe wrapped his arm around my neck. 
Look, I don't know what's on those tapes, but we need to stop. This isn't healthy and it's driving you crazy. You're seeing shit and smelling rotten eggs? That isn't good. With a reluctant sigh, I agreed. Yeah, you're right. In that moment, something clicked and my eyes widened. I told Joe that I smelled something, but I didn't tell him what it was. Joe? I asked. Yeah, what's up? I never told you what the smell was. How did you know it was rotten eggs? Joe was quiet for a moment. I stared at him as he flashed me a smile. I jumped backward as Joe flung himself onto me. I tried to resist as much as I could, but I knew that there was nothing I could do. Joe, who was now looking more like the creature, stuck his tongue out and began to drag it across my cheek. I was frozen with fear. I couldn't move any part of my body no matter how hard I tried. I laid there, completely motionless. Its breath was unbearable. No matter how much I squirmed or screamed, it wouldn't loosen its grip on me. The creature extended its finger and dragged it across my cheek, drawing blood in the process. I stared into its eyes, and it felt like I was staring face to face with Satan himself. Accepting my fate, I closed my eyes and expected the worst. That's all I remember. I woke up some time later in the familiar surroundings of a hospital. I was then greeted by my fiancé and a group of doctors. Oh, thank God. Are you okay? My fiancé screamed as she began to cry. There was a tube down my throat which was preventing me from answering. But I nodded my head. Soon enough, the doctors came and removed the feeding tube from my throat. I couldn't describe the feeling, but it's nothing I ever want to experience again. I was in a coma for a solid week. A neighbor that lived next to my parents' house found me in the basement at the bottom, completely unconscious. Apparently, the front door was open, and the neighbor was worried. I'm alive thanks to him. Nothing made sense to me. Where's Joe? I questioned. My fiancé had a look of confusion on her face. Honey, do you not remember? She said, wiping a tear from her eye. TJ, Joe died in that accident with your parents. I shook my head. My entire world flashed before my eyes. How is that possible? I had just seen Joe moments before I blacked out, right? Or was everything just in my head? What about the videotapes? I asked. What videotapes? The videotapes in my parents' house. Where are they? They were in a brown box on the coffee table. My fiancé shook her head, as if she had no idea what I was talking about. Everything took place in my head. From Joe, to the videotapes, the creature, everything was all just in my head. I felt sick to my stomach, perhaps from the medicine that I was on. My fiancé ran her fingers through my hair to calm me down but nothing seemed real. Hell, was this even real? After a few days in the hospital to recover, I was allowed to go home. My fiancé told me everything. I received a call while I was away at college that my parents and brother died in a car accident. Joe was driving them somewhere when the car slid off an embankment and crashed. I guess the mind works in mysterious ways. Despite losing my brother and my parents, things seemed to be normal for once. The entire ordeal, even though it played out in my subconscious, it was over. I was a bit confused as to why I was in the house to begin with, but everything started to come back eventually. After the funeral, I went to the house to get some belongings. I must have blacked out shortly after and imagined the entire thing, including Joe. In my subconscious, I don't remember blacking out, but I vividly remember Joe. I remember him smoking one of Dad's cigars. I remember him freaking out about the videotapes and whatnot. Everything seemed so real, and the fact that this all took place in my head just left me completely dumbfounded. I went back to the home a few days later. The basement was just as I remembered it, but no matter how much time I spent in there, I never did find the videotapes. They were gone, or perhaps they were never there to begin with. As I sat in the basement, I sighed with relief and walked back up into the living room shut the door behind me, and locked it, never looking back. Eventually, the home became the property of the bank, and a family of four moved in shortly after. That part of my life was behind me, 
I eventually graduated, and we both moved into a nice two-bedroom home in the city. My fiancé eventually became pregnant with our first child. We're expecting in the next few months. It's a boy. We're naming him Elijah, after my grandfather. We're hoping to have another child sometime after Elijah is born. Hopefully a girl. We just want to start a family and live happily ever after, as cheesy as that sounds. The wedding is planned after the birth of Elijah. Her parents weren't too happy that we conceived before we were married, but they'll have to get over it. It's not like they have a choice. As for the blackouts, I haven't had them since the last incident in the basement. Sure, I still think about what happened, but I have to remind myself that it was all just in my head. None of it was real. Things are good for the most part, but my fiancé has been acting strange. She keeps saying that I've changed and have grown a bit irritable. I've done nothing that I can think of. Perhaps it's just the pregnancy hormones or something like that. She caught me sleepwalking a few times at night and said I looked as if I were in a trance. The house that we just bought, which we thought was going to be our dream home, turned out not to be the paradise that we had hoped. She keeps telling me that she smells a foul odor in the home, and she feels it's going to be bad for the baby. She keeps trying to get me to fix it, but I have no idea what she's talking about, because I don't smell anything. There's always a reason.